सदगुरु परमात्मा ने नमो नमः। आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल द डेलीगेट्स एंड स्कॉलर्स टू असेंबल इन द हॉल एज वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द थर्ड प्लेनरी सेशन दैट इज द सेकेंड डेज प्रोसीडिंग ऑफ दिस एशिया फिलोसॉफी कॉन्फ्रेंस 2018। प्लीज हु is there in outside or in the bhojanalay please do complete quickly and do come thank honorable you honorable chair shri swami shri hari prasad ji of vishnu mohan foundation chennai and co chair professor jata shankar well known scholar member secretary of icpr new delhi and the speakers are professor jio liang li he is from sun moon university south korea second speaker will be uh, dr thich tham duck vice rector and general secretary vietnam buddhist research institute ho chi minh city and the third speaker is dr shailesh mehta hsrc surat so i request all honorable uh, scholars to have have your seat on the dais thank you so as i said our honorable chair is shri swami shri hari prasad ji of vishnu mohan foundation chennai namaskarami bhagwan bhavatam upasthitya vayam sarve upakritah आदरणीय कनुदादा महाभागा संप्राता तेभ्या आदरेशु वह सविनय प्रणमा आदरणीय कनुदादा कनुदादा अरेवट देन को चेयर श्री प्रोफेसर जटाशंकर ही इज रिप्लेसिंग मेंबर सेक्रेटरी ऑफ आईसीपीआर जटा शब्द से अभी मुझे योगेश शुक्ल जी कह रहे थे कि जो शिव तांडव स्त्रोत्र है आप इसका एक श्लोक सुनाए तो जटा से ही शुरू होता है जटा कटा हसम भ्रम भ्रमण निलिम्प नीरजरी विलोल वीची वल्लरी विराजमान मूर्धनी धगत 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 ज्वल ललाट पट्ट पावके किशोर चंद्र शेखरे रति प्रति क्षण मम रति प्रति क्षण मम प्रोफेसर जटाशंकर सर वी आर ऑब्लाइज थैंक यू वेरी मच बाय योर प्रेजेंस and then our honorable speakers first of all professor jio liang li he is from sun moon university south korea sir please sir yeah only yesterday professor godabarish mishra ji has said about you you studied in india with him and then in the south korea you have spread out the whole philosophy and this holistic science etc thank you very much sir then dr thich tam duck he is from ho chi minh city vietnam buddhist research institute general secretary when we see or we hear about the buddhist philosophy or buddhist way of thinking immediately we remember buddham sharanam गच्छामि धम्मम शरणम गच्छामि संघम शरणम गच्छामि दैट इज आत्मदीपो भव सर्व वैदिक वांगमय वर्तते भवंतु डॉक्टर सुरेश मेहता एच आर आर सी सूरत वेरी वेल नोन श्री शैलेश डॉक्टर शैलेश मेहता जी सॉरी सर प्लीज शैलेश डॉक्टर शैलेश मेहता जी सो आई विल रेस्पेक्ट एंड इनवाइट प्रोफेसर जियो लिंगली द फर्स्ट स्पीकर ऑफ अवर दिस सेशन प्लीज हेलो रेस्पेक्टेड छे 
Shri Swami Hariprasad, Shri Vishnu Mohan Foundation of, from Chennai, and Professor Rajini Sukla, and uh, respected professors and scholars and friends. The topic of my paper this morning is suffering as a starting point of discovering the world within. The history of uh, spiritual Hinduism is largely the history of man's yearning for fundamental solution to the problem of human suffering. Because uh, I don't have enough time to read my paper, so I have to skip some part of my paper. According to Sankhya, wherever there are, there are gunas, there are pains. Even the so-called pleasures lead us to pain. Man is a combination of soul and body, and the body exists for experience and liberation for Purusha. Broadly speaking, experience here means pain and suffering. The fact that I am alive means that I have a living body, and the body is basically composed of kunas. Therefore, having a body means that my life is suffering, because my body and the material world on which it is placed are made of kunas, my life is in itself suffering. As long as I have a living body, I cannot avoid the suffering, which is the ontological condition of human beings. The desires of a living person to have no suffering is like denying his own fundamental foundations. First, one thing to be pointed out here is that suffering is not the object of removal. Suffering is the object of overcoming. As long as we are alive, pain and suffering are always with our lives. Suffering is an inescapable and integral part of life. Suffering is a part of living until finally reaching moksha. Until reaching this state, suffering is always present on our own life's path. Hindu tradition holds that since we are in human form on earth, we are bound by the laws of our world and will experience pain and suffering. Therefore, what we need to pay attention to in this life is not a painless life, but the process of overcoming pain and suffering. Regardless of whether we reach our destination or not, our effort to overcome suffering has its own significance. As mentioned before, Suffering is the object of overcoming in our life. Nevertheless, our final destination is not a life without suffering. The answer may lie elsewhere. In this regard, I would like to share a story of dream I had previously. In my dream, I was traveling in India with my friends and met a wedding procession on the street of a city. I danced with them and went back to my hotel. Then I found out that I had lost my wallet. Of course, I was very distressed. How distressing is it that you lost your wallet on when you are traveling in a strange city? To find my lost wallet, I lost it to the street where I was playing with the Mary's procession. No matter how hard I looked, my wallet was not visible. Then suddenly, I found my wallet on the street and I checked inside my wallet. Unfortunately, it was already an empty wallet. Someone had taken the cash and credit card that was in it. And I was found, what I found was an empty wallet. In my dream, I was very weak. I suddenly realized that I had to report my lost credit card to the company. I heard it to go to the phone shop near the hotel and I started dialing to make a call to report the loss of my credit card. However, in the process of dialing, I repeatedly made a mistake dialing the last number. My mind was so frustrated. Then suddenly I woke from the dream. At that, at the moment of awakening from the dream, my feelings were so refreshed. It seemed as if my mind was as light as if it was flying. In my dream, I had lost my wallet and to solve the serious problem of finding my wallet was my top priority. However, 
The problem of losing my wallet in my dream was solved, not because I found my wallet, but because I woke up from the, my dream. The moment I woke from the dream, neither losing my wallet nor failing to find it was any problem. Even my mistake in, in dialing that made me so frustrated was not a problem at all. The important thing was to awaken from the dream. But how could I awake from my dream? Thanks to my hard work to find my wallet, I was able to wake up from my dream. To be more precise, what made me awake from the dream was the heaviness in my mind that came as a result of my hard work to find my wallet. Our life of seeking to achieve the ultimate goal of nirvana is no different than trying to find the wallet in the dream. The suffering we experience in our life is the heaviness of our mind that comes from the inability to find the wallet. Just as the distress of our mind in our dream awakens us from the dream, the suffering we experience in our life also frees us from samsara. If there is no suffering in our life, it should be said that we are not likely to escape from samsara. From this perspective, the teaching that life is suffering is rather a message that life is hopeful because only a disease with pain can be cured. A disease without pain is incurable. Cancer is a typical example of an incurable disease. Suffering is a sign that it can be cured or that it is being cured. The meaning of life as suffering is like this. Having pain in life is a positive sign that the life, the life poisoned by eyes can be cured or is currently being cured. Therefore, we must first admit to the fact that life is suffering. We can see what is the next only if we forgive the suffering in our life. The two directions from which the awareness of life is suffering arises. When there is an experiential awareness that life is suffering, our journey to discover the world within begins. If anyone does not realize that life is suffering, it means that he has not yet begun the first step of the inner journey. Of course, it cannot be simply an intellectual understanding that life is suffering. Understanding life on a rational basis is not much help to us on our journey to the inner world. The shift of attention from the outside world to an interest in the inner world occurs with the awareness that life is suffering. And this is possible when we can see the outside world as it is. Only wisdom that is obtained by our own experience allows us to take the first step on our journey to in the world. The awareness that life is suffering comes to us from two opposing directions. One is from the sudden poverty of material and external environment, and the other is from material abundance. Let's first consider the first case. For example, suppose a businessman suddenly goes bankrupt. At this time, there are two kinds of thought that can happen to him. One is, will I commit suicide? And the other, will I go into the mountains and become a monk? Certain bankruptcy has caused this kind of thinking that had never happened to him previously. In other words, the certain bankruptcy has given him an awareness that life is suffering, which leads to an opportunity to die or become a monk. This example refers to cases in which the awareness that life is suffering comes from when one is afflicted with external miseries and suffering. Contrary to the above example, material abundance, abundance may be the cause of the awareness that life is suffering. In this case, the awareness that life is suffering is expressed in the expression, it is not all of life that I eat well, live well, and die. In view of the denial of present life, this case is not much different from the case mentioned above. The start to the inner world begins with despair of the reality we live in. There is no beginning to the inner world. 
unless there is despair in the reality we live in. Let's take another example. When a person has a good business and that person's environment becomes materially very affluent, there are two possibilities for him. One is hedonism and the other is an interest in the inner world. Material abundance is extremely dangerous to people. The reason is that it creates the possibility that a person can become a man of spirituality, but it is also may cause a person to become a prodigal human. In this regard, certain bankruptcy is dangerous, but certain material abundance is also dangerous. If the former has the risk of provoking suicide, the latter risk of causing a person to fall into a material depri deprivation. When we say that material abundance is dangerous, it does not mean that it should be avoided because it is dangerous. To be dangerous implies only to be careful. It is no different than giving up all the important things to accomplish in our lives, lives in order to avoid what is dangerous. To be dangerous means that it is very lethal to us and what is so fatal to us is also very precious to us. It is as if a poison that can cause deadly harm to a person's life can also be a valuable medicine that can save the life of a dying person. Barmas of Ayurveda are the vital points in the body where the life force energy is concentrated and therefore these points can be used to cure many diseases and ailments. However, it is said that an advanced Galari master can disable or kill his opponent merely by touching the correct marma point. In general, the beginning of Christian faith is often associated with misery or pervert in the external environment. The typical Jesus Christ is a typical example of this. I will skip this part. On the contrary, the prosperity of Indian religious traditions, including Buddhism, was always based on material abundance. This can be easily understood by considering the rising and flourishing of Buddhism in India. Throughout the history of Buddhism, the rise of Buddhism is accompanied by material well-being. The life of Buddha, the Buddha is in stark contrast to the life of Jesus Christ. Unlike Jesus Christ, who had an unfortunate childhood, the Gautama Buddha was born a prince of the Sakyas and experienced the greatest material luxuries that he could enjoy at that time. According to Jataka, even his father prevented princess, Prince Siddhartha from encountering the scenes of sickness, old age, death, and asceticism so that Siddhartha would not know that life is suffering. Despite this kind of consideration, one day Siddhartha put on the yellow loaves and went forth from his home to a homeless condition against the wishes of his weeping parents. The Buddha's entering into homelessness was caused by the awareness that life is suffering that comes from material abundance. Ashrama Dharma is Hindu way of uh, inner journey to self-realization. Ashrama Dharma shows us that Sanatana Dharma becomes meaningful only when material affluence, affluence has been achieved. In societies with dire poverty, Sanatana Dharma is just meaningless. When the first two stages of Ashrama Dharma, that is Brahmacharya and Grihastha, are successful, that is, when Artha and Gama are realized, the last two stages, Panaparastha and Sanyasa, can be preceded and become meaningful. Therefore, mental richness is at least a requirement for, requirement for the realization of Sanatana Dharma. The same is true in Buddha Dharma. Throughout the history of Buddhism, the rise of Buddhism, Buddha Dharma is accompanied by material well-being. Buddha Dharma and Sanatana Dharma were established on the basis of material prosperity. Only when wealth is erode do they have significance. As a way of discovering the world within, the most important feature of Ashrama Dharma lies in making us realize that life is suffering in a gradual way. 
If a person suddenly encounters that life is suffering, it becomes hard to bear. Without preparation, if a person suddenly encounters the awareness that life is suffering, then he is unlikely to be able to bear it and is likely to become useless or dead. But if he progressively meets it through the preparation process, it can be the basis of an inner journey for spiritual progress. In addition, although Ashrama Dharma emphasized this, that we must first achieve material abundance in the pursuit of spirituality. Nevertheless, we voluntarily give up the material abundance and set forth on the inner journey for spiritual progress. The first and the second four ashrama of human life, that is Brahmacharya and Grihastha, are the stages of preparing for spontaneous giving up, the pursuit of the knowledge of Brahman and the practice of celibacy is the essence of brahmacharya. And the obligation of the head of a family is to produce children and to accumulate wealth. However, the first and the second stages are not for the sake of themselves, but are for the sake for next two stages of Anabrasta and Sanyasa. As one transfers from Brihasta to Banaprastya, spontaneous giving up or grand renunciation is necessary. Yet, that is not to say that the first and the second stages are less significant than the next two stages. If one does not devote oneself to the first and the second stages, one cannot see grand renunciation happen or one will just see a languishing giving up. The the process of transferring from Krihastya to Parapurasta is compared to entering the priesthood in Buddhism, which is the behavior to sacrifice oneself to realize dharma. If not that, then it is the learning away from home, not then entering into entering, entering the priesthood. Here, the grand giving up is likened to the process where a plane takes off. The first and second stages are the process where a plane taxis out upon the runway and the grand giving of its takeoff. The next two stages are compared to the flying flight into the sky. If the plane did not taxi out upon the runway, the takeoff would be impossible. Therefore, it is quite critical for one to devote oneself to Brahmacharya and Grihastha. However, if the plane keeps taxiing out upon the runway, what will happen? The flight into the sky will not happen, and the plane may even collide with an airport building, which might cause a serious accident. The first and two, the first two stages are compared to the daily routine, while the next two stages represent departure from the routine. The daily routine is for the sake of comfort, while departure is for freedom. The daily routine is safe, but departure is dangerous. As long as one seeks for freedom rather than comfort, spontaneous giving up and departure into danger, which upholds the spirit of Ashrama Dharma, should not be missed. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Very interesting paper.